another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, Records of Death. For Nick Carter and the mystery of the unclaimed box. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Carter, that I have quite accidentally stumbled on a terrible crime. Or, to be more correct, I've stumbled on evidence that a terrible crime has been committed. But even so, Mr. Field, why do you come to me with it? That sort of thing should be reported to the police. Mr. Carter, what police would I report it to? Where was the murder committed? I don't know. Well, how can you know that a murder's been done if you don't know where it was done? Well, that's what makes this particular crime different from any other. Somewhere, sometime, a murder has been committed. Yet I don't know when or where. As a matter of fact, I doubt if anyone in the world knows of it, except those who did it, and me. And how do you happen to know all this? Because the victim, a young and beautiful girl, has told me so in her own words. I have the knowledge from her own lips. Oh. And you've seen and talked to her? Well, here's the story, Mr. Carter. About a month ago, I attended one of the sales of unclaimed packages that the express company holds twice a year. Among other things, I bought was a box about one-third the size of a steamer trunk. It contained some miscellaneous articles of clothing and ten phonograph records. Phonograph records, huh? Regular professional records? No, Mr. Carter. They were small record blanks you buy when you make home recordings for yourself. I immediately played the records, and since then I've played them so often, I almost know them by heart. And you learn about this crime from those records? Yes. Mr. Field, you want to arouse my curiosity. You certainly succeeded. When can I hear these records? Immediately, Mr. Carter. I have them in my room. If you'll go there with me, we can listen to them at once. Splendid. You mind if I take my assistant, Patsy Bowen, with me? Of course not. Then as soon as she's ready, we'll go. Patsy! Yes, sir? Get your hat. We're leaving at once to listen to a murder. <laughs> This is the box, Mr. Carter. Beautiful, isn't it? Now, Mr. Field, before we go further, there are a few things I should like to know. How long ago did you buy this box at the auction? A little over a month ago. Mm-hmm. On the express company. Must have had it for about a year or so. Another thing. Were there any wrappings on the box when you bought it? Yes, it was well wrapped in heavy burlap. You have those wrappings now? I'm sorry to say I don't. By the time I realized that the wrappings might have furnished a clue to the mystery, they'd been burned in the incinerator. Too bad. Well, do you by any chance, whatever, recall the name and address to which the box was consigned? Fortunately, I do. It was addressed to an Alex Delanois in New York City. But I've searched every city directory, every telephone book, every place where names are listed, and I can find no such name anywhere. There was no street address, and the rest of the label, as I remember it, was practically obliterated. I see. All right, Mr. Field, let's listen to the records. And gladly. I'm very anxious to get your opinion of them. Are they in any kind of order? Well, after hearing them over and over, as I've done, I believe that I've finally arranged them in their proper order. I see. They're so peculiar, I can hardly wait to see if you can tell me the answer. Here's the first one. I have a terrible story to tell. But even while I try to tell it, I'm afraid that you who may listen to this will not believe me. But I beg you, if justice means anything to you, believe me and avenge me. I shall rest easier in my grave if I know that those who hope to profit by my death have been deprived of the fortune they plan to get by killing me. I am very rich, but I am not rich enough to avoid the fate that is in store for me. She sounds as if she meant it, doesn't she? I thought he was coming in, but he went away. I've tried several times to escape, but I've failed each time. I wish I could tell you where I am, but I can't. Because I was drugged when they brought me here. Oh, I, I forgot to say, my name is Nancy Deering, and I'm 22 years old. You who listen to this will recognize the name at once, of course. I only hope they don't murder me until I can... Is that the end of it? Not quite. He almost caught me that time. But now he's left me alone again. Maybe I can... That's all. Apparently he came back before she expected him. She certainly had plenty of trouble getting a story out of the records, didn't she? Yes. She was interrupted many times. And generally in the wrong places. I imagine no trouble is too great if you're really desperate. What a terrible feeling it must be to expect to be killed any minute. Here's the second record if you're ready. Okay, Phil. I don't know where I left off with my story last time... I dare not play it back. If they should ever hear what I'm trying to do, they take the machine away from me. Then I'd be completely lost. 
I feel that my end is coming very soon now. They may carry out their plans to... In the gloaming, oh, my darling, when the lights are soft and low, and the flickering... I think he's gone now. I'm sure Ralph was listening at the door, but the singing apparently convinced him I was listening to the radio. When the time comes, I know it will be Ralph who kills me. Olive will undoubtedly help him, but Ralph is the leader. I found that out the other day when they tried to get me to sign the papers which will give them possession of my fortune. I shall never sign, but that... When the light... The rest of the records that song. They did her best. And story those records. Too bad she didn't succeed better. Well, she managed to get most of her story on the records one way or another. The only thing she really missed out on was telling us more about herself than just her name. Probably never occurred to her that the records might travel thousands of miles before someone would hear them. Yeah, here's the third record. Last night, somebody searched my rooms while I was in bed. Maybe they suspect that I'm making these records. Although I'm very careful. I play the radio all the time so they'll be used to hearing the noise. Ralph told me yesterday he was sure I was going crazy. Maybe I... Nancy, Olive asked me to tell you that. And that ends that. Whose voice do you suppose that was there at the end? I suspect it was Ralph's. It's amazing how much of the scene she recreates this way without really saying anything definite. You can feel the tension and the suspense right along with her. Yes. On the fourth record, she was able to get part of the visit that Ralph paid her one day. She must have known he was coming and prepared for it by putting the record blank on the machine in advance. Then, when she heard him at the door, she probably turned it on and got this. Well, put it on quickly, Mr. Field. Here you are, Miss Bourne. Well, my beautiful young half-sister, have you decided to sign over your fortune to me? I told you long ago I'd never do that. If you sign, we'll set you free, just as we promised. You go fool me, Ralph. The minute I sign my name to that paper you have there, you'll kill me. You know that as well as I do. You set me free. <laughs> That's funny. Ah, you don't know when you're well off, Nancy. If you did, you'd sign and go free. You must think I'm a fool, Ralph. I do. And I also think it won't be long before you wish you had signed. <clears throat> oh, I wish this were all over. I wonder how they'll kill me. Ralph had preferred to strangle me, I'm sure. With those great, hairy hands of his. As for Olive, here she'd use poison on the boot. And that's all there is on that one. It's a pity she couldn't have put more on each record than she did. She really used only a small portion of each blank. Yes, Bessie, but she had trouble enough to get even that much on them, the way they watched her. Nick, where could she get the blank records in the first place? They certainly wouldn't have let her have them knowingly. If I were to make a guess, Patsy, I'd say that when they took her to the place where she was kept prisoner, they probably took along her clothes and some of her furnishings. Mm-hmm. And among them probably was this radio phonograph. Perhaps she specially asked for it because she loved music or something, and the record blanks were probably the machine along with the other records. Mm, that could be. Uh, how about the fifth record, Mr. Field? I've never been able to make much out of this one. Maybe you'll have better luck. You mean it's not like the others? I'm quite different. Here, I'll start it near the end. The whole first part is a scratch and nothing else. <laughs> Saying anything. 
Then Ralph and Olive came, found the door locked, and, being suspicious, broke it down. Nancy hid, and they dragged her out. There was an argument about something that I didn't get. Nancy grabbed Ralph's pistol and took a quick shot at him, but she missed. Before she could pull the trigger again, he took the gun away from her. Good grief, Mr. Carter. It's clear enough when you tell it. Well, here's the sixth one. I'm Terry. The time is very short. I may be interrupted any minute. I'm seldom left alone anymore. They seem to be afraid of what I'll do if I'm left alone. I wonder that they haven't killed me before this. I wonder if they... There's nothing but scratch for quite a bit here, but she starts again. Olive came in. I had to stop. Now she's gone for a few minutes at least. Yesterday I wrote a letter to my father and I threw it out the window, hoping someone would find it and mail it. But Ralph found it and brought it back to me and laughed at me. I keep asking him for news of my father, but he'll tell me nothing. If father only knew where I am, he'd rescue me. Maybe if I can jump. And that's the end of that. Well, we didn't get much out of it. I wonder where father comes into this. You know what before we're through? And this seventh racket is more interesting. Because it records a complete conversation between Nancy and Ralph. Good. Let's hear it. your way, I'd be dead. <laughs> Why don't you kill yourself and save us the trouble? You mean save you from having a murder on your conscience? You have such a thing? Murder is a very ugly word, Nancy. You're murdering me inch by inch every day that I stay here. Well, I don't object to doing it that way if I can. Why did you? <laughs> if you ever throw anything at me like that again, I'll, I'll tie up so you won't be able to move out of your chair. Ralph, if you really want me to sign those papers for you, just let me go to my father. If you do, I'll sign anything you ask. That's out of the question, Anne. But if you sign, we'll, we'll see that your father finds you soon enough. And it's only because I'm your half-brother that I offer you this. You sneaking liar! I wish we could have had more of that. Yes. We might have learned something really important. You will. Nancy knew the record was near the end, and that glass of water was merely an excuse to get Ralph out of the room while she put on a new one. Good for her. She's a clever girl. Look, what a terrible ordeal she went through, never knowing from one day to the next whether it was her last. Quiet, Betsy, please. Thank you. You were gone quite a long time. I met all of them in the hall. She reminded me to tell you... We've decided that unless you do as we want you to, you have just one more day to live. Just one. Doing that frightens me. I'll almost welcome death. But I know it's the only way I'll ever get away from you two. And I'm firmly convinced you'll never succeed in getting possession of my fortune. <laughs> of course we'll get it. No doubt about that. I don't think you will. No? No. That is, you won't get it unless you're planning on murdering my father, too. After you forged a new will for him to leave behind him. You're smart, aren't you? Guessed it the first time. No. No, you wouldn't. You couldn't. No, why not? He's not my father. And we want his fortune for ourselves. I can't believe such inhuman creatures as you two really exist. <laughs> Our mother bore a strange lot of children, didn't she? On one hand, we have you, my saintly Nancy. And on the other hand, we have the twins, Olivet and me, who are anything but saintly. <laughs> yes, life is very strange sometimes. Get out! Get out of me, my God! Don't let me with you! That's an excellent idea, Nancy. I'll be gone for a 
about 15 minutes. If you're wise, you won't be alive when I return. Goodbye. I hope forever. You heard what he said. It was the best evidence I could get. Ralph really made a full confession without knowing that every word he said was being preserved for you to hear. But my father, while he died, oh, I beg you, whoever you are, hears his word. If you can do anything to avenge our death, in heaven's name, do it. I go to my death believing that through you I shall have my revenge at last. Oh, please don't fail me. I see the records coming to an end. Good night. Pray for me. Good God. <laughs> if you didn't know she was in deadly earnest, you'd almost think she was putting on an act. I still feel terribly moved when I hear that record. She never had a chance, really. Well, let's hear the next one. That's the ninth, isn't it? Yeah, uh, number nine is almost a blank. But here it is. They almost caught me that time. They mustn't do that because they might find the records I've already made and destroy them. They're both coming back in a few minutes, but maybe I can... Is that all there is on that one? That's all. That's the end of the record. There's one more, isn't there? Yes. Uh, number ten. The first two thirds of it's blank. It starts here. Stand back, both of you. What no, what did you see? I'm armed. You know I can shoot and shoot straight. I'll kill the first one of you to move. Come, Parker. That's my gun. Where did you get it? Oliver gave it to me so I could defend myself. Uh, that's a lie. You know it. What is it? That's the most remarkably told tragedy in history. Well, Mr. Carter, have you got any ideas? I have, but I'm not ready to talk about them yet. Well, what's the next step now, Nick? Well, first of all, Patsy, I want to examine the other contents of the box thoroughly. I can look them over more intelligently now that I've heard the records. Then I want to play those records over and over until I know them by heart. And then? Then I expect to be able to give you the answer to the problem. Got a sandwich in your pocket, Patsy? Oh, Nick, I thought you'd never finish listening to those records. Well, I want to be sure I didn't miss anything anyway. And I believe I've learned everything those records could tell me. You mean you really found some clues, Nick? Yes, indeed, Patsy. There are several clues marked out for us very plainly. Oh, that's wonderful. But first, I want to go over that list from head of the other things that were in that box addressed to Alex Delanois. Of course, Nick. Let me see now. Um, oh, yes, here it is. Opera cloak with label Felix and Company Toronto. And a beautiful and expensive thing it was, too. Mm. Silk slip with the name Olivet Dupre pinned on it. Wish I could wear silk like that. That's it. A silk slip with the name Nancy Deering pinned to it. A New Testament with the name Evangeline Dupre on the flyleaf. Several rings, all very valuable. A real pearl necklace. And some beautiful and very expensive lace. Also, of course, the blood-stained nightdress, which must have been the one that Nancy was murdered in. And the three snapshots, of course. Oh, yes. One with the name Olivet on the back. One with the name Ralph, and one with the name Evangeline Dupre Deering. Whoever packed that box knew exactly what he was doing, Patsy. All ties together beautifully. He or she has given us all the clues he could to the people concerned in the affair. Evangeline Dupre Deering must have been the mother. Yes. She had two children, twins, Ralph and Olivet, by her first marriage. Then she married Nancy's father, a man named Deering. But that doesn't get as much nearer a solution, Nick. No, but it does, Patsy. 
Did you notice that all the voices we heard on the records were American? Well, yes, I guess they were. And yet the names are mostly French, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Now, where do we find a combination like that around here? Why, in Canada, I suppose. Exactly. And the label on the opera cloak says Toronto, which confirms the Canada idea perfectly. You mean that the Deerings lived in Toronto? Well, it's certainly quite logical to assume that the scene of the murder is Canada, and very possibly in the vicinity of Toronto. Well, we start there anyway. Maybe the Toronto police can help us. But, Nick, even if you're right, it doesn't mean that the police would know anything about the murder. It was all done so secretly. You're overlooking one thing, Patsy. I am? Well, what is it? The family from which these people came was a rich family. Very rich indeed, if we may guess from the beautiful laces and from the jewelry and other things packed in the box. Mm-hmm. And remember also that Nancy's father was probably killed, too. Now, I can't believe that the head of a rich and probably well-known family could disappear without anyone knowing it. You mean you think the police will know that something happened to him about a year ago, even if they don't think that there's anything wrong about it? Exactly. So pack your bag, Patsy, and order a taxi to take us to the airport. We're flying to Toronto immediately. I'm very happy to welcome you back to Toronto, Mr. Carter. It's been many years since you've been up here to see us. Well, thanks very much, Chief. Now, you mind if I ask you a few questions? No, of course not. Go right ahead. Did you get a letter about a year ago telling that a murder had been done and that if you wanted proof, you should claim an express box sent to New York City in the name of Alex Dunnanwell? Wait a minute. By George Carter, we did get just such a letter. But we thought it was the work of a crank and destroyed it. Did you mean it was true? I have every reason to believe it was. Now, another question. Would you know anything about a girl named Nancy Deering or about her father? For heaven's sake, Carter, what do you know about the Deering family? You answer my question first, I'll answer yours. Now, what about the Deering? Uh, the father, Charles Deering, is, is or was the younger son of an English nobleman. Mm-hmm. He was immensely rich at a house here in town, a country place called Deering Hall. He married a woman with two children, twins, I believe, and she died when his daughter Nancy was born. He's always prominent in local affairs up to about a year ago when he said to have disappeared. Hasn't been seen since. I understand he started for Deering Hall but never arrived there, according to his two stepchildren. What about his daughter, Nancy? Nancy was brought up by relatives in Montreal. Few people here know her at all. But as I remember it, she was supposed to have disappeared just before her father did. Although I now understand that she was at Deering Hall with her half-brother and sister all the time. You say Nancy didn't disappear after all? I know. As a matter of fact, uh, she was here in Toronto this past week. She believes her father is dead, so she's applied for letters of administration for the estate. I thought so. You did? What do you know about it? Enough to know that this girl who calls herself Nancy Deering isn't Nancy Deering at all. She's an imposter whom the stepchildren have brought in to impersonate her. Chief, we got to get out to Deering Hall at once. <laughs> into the Deering estate turns off somewhere right in here, Carter. I'm not quite sure. Well, look, Chief. There's a man standing in the road up ahead. Oh, so there is. And he's motioning to us to stop. He looks almost like a dwarf, doesn't he? He's certainly a queer-looking individual. If we help you, I'm going to the hall. Yes, we are. Why? Could you take me back there? I have walked so far, I am tired out. Oh, of course. Climb in. (laughs) What? You are a policeman, no? Yes, I am. Oh, then you can help me. And I need help so very much. What seems to be the trouble? My name is Alex Delanois. I am the... Alex Delanois? But yes, you know me. You once sent a box packed with records and other things to New York City addressed to yourself? Oh, but yes, you have seen it. Yes, that's why we're here. Tell me, how did you ever happen yes, to... Yes, yes, I will tell you everything. I was the caretaker at the hall. Miss Deering let me stay in one of the old tower rooms... Because I am, as you see, a cripple. Sometimes I, I do not get out of bed for days at a time. About a year ago, the two stepchildren of those so very wicked devils came to the hall. They brought a girl who was kept a prisoner in one of the bedrooms. Alex, isn't that the hall, road to the hall just ahead? Then? No, but yes. The hall is about a half a mile in of this road. Go on with your story, Alex. Yeah, uh, the, the girl was so carefully guarded by those two, uh, I could not get to her room. I could not help her. I am a cripple. No, you did what you could, Alex. You being there helped her, I know. How did you manage to get the things packed in the box? 
after they killed Namsi. <laughs> they did not guard their room so carefully. I got in, I took the records and the other things and packed them in the box. A fisherman I know up by the lake sent the box by experts for me. I wrote to the police in Toronto and in New York and told them what had happened and asked them to claim this box. But I am afraid they did not do it. No, we didn't. We thought the letter was just a hoax. What about Nancy's father? Ah, uh, the day after Nancy was killed, he came here and they tried to kill him too. Tried to? You mean they didn't succeed? Oh, no, no, not quite. They hit him on the head with a pistol and threw him into the lake from the high cliff. Ah, but I saw them do it and I rescued him. I took him to my home and nursed him myself until he could get a doctor. Well, how is he now? Well, he's about well now, I think. There's the house right ahead, Nick. Drive right up to the door, Chief. I'll go ahead. You keep in the background in case they know you. Okay, Carter. Well, I'll be right behind you. Alex, you and Patsy stay here in the car. Oh, but of course. Sure, Nick. Yes? What is it, please? Please tell Miss Deering that we've come to take some affidavits concerning her application as administratrix for the estate. Yes, sir. Well, come in, please. I'll announce you. It's your turn now, Chief. I'll stand here one side of the door, just in case. I can handle them, Carter. Maybe, but they're going to be quiet. Here they come. Well, gentlemen, what can we Dr. do? Dr. Gray, I arrest you and your sister Olivet for the murder. I'll take that gun to play with me. Oh, no, you don't. Right. Right. Hey, this pair of hands just will take care of you. Oh, you need any help, Carter? Oh, no, I can take Stop. care of him. Oh. 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 Nice work, Carter. Well, hank us on him. They both keep safely till we can put them behind the bars. And we can now restore Deering Hall to his rightful owner once more. Even though it's almost a year later, the box that Alex Eleanor packed has fulfilled his destiny. has been another of the strange adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by WOR Mutual. What's your story going to be about next week, Nick? Well, next week I'm going to tell you the tale of the thief and murderer who had to be caught twice before he was really caught at all. And when Nick caught him the second time, it was because he was able to guess in advance exactly what the criminal was going to do as well as exactly what he was going to think. And what did you say the crime was? Merely a matter of murder and robbery. Well, there was nothing unusual in the crime itself. The excitement came, and the way Nick chased him, outsmarted him, and finally caught him. It's a very special example of the criminal who was just a little too clever for his own good. He overrated himself and underrated Nick. That's always dangerous where Nick Carter is concerned. Thanks to the compliment. And so long till next week. So long, everybody. And so long to you both. In the strange adventure you've just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. Original music was played by Lou White, and the entire production was written and directed by Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... The Unwilling Accomplice. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Society Burglar. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. This is Mutual. Mutual.